Johnny Dollar. Like to hop aboard the next plane headed for the mighty sovereign state of Texas? Why not? And who that? Jack Price here in Corpus Christi. <laughs> oh, hi, Jackson. How about it? Well, you know, I like that town of yours, Jack. I always have. But unless your company plans to pay the freight, forget it. I can't afford it. Now, you don't think for one minute I'd be inviting a character like you down here in just a social call. Why not? I'm a very sociable fellow. Oh, sure. Especially when you're on expense account. Naturally. Or when your investigation saves us a lot of money and you can pick up a nice commission for it. Sure. But this time, pal, there's no way you can save us anything. As a matter of fact, if what I suspect is true, you'll only cost us money. Now, that doesn't make much sense. Doesn't it? Well, does it? Why don't you come down here and see? On expense account. Yeah, yeah, on expense account. But no extras. Bare minimum expense account. Right. No chance of a commission. Uh, none. But maybe just a nice little service fee, just for old time's sake? No. Oh, now, Jackson, listen, do you really think I'd accept an assignment like that from you of all people? I cannot tell a lie, Johnny. I think you would. You want to know something, pal? Yeah. You're right. <laughs> The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to try Western Life Insurance Company Corpus Christi office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Ike and Mike matter. Expense account item one, five dollars and sixty-five cents for a taxi out to Bradley Field. As for item two, well, in spite of this demand for economy, I'm sure the company treasurer won't object to my not thumbing my way to Corpus Christi. So item two is 122.23 for a plane ticket. But to make up for it, after I got there, instead of a taxi, I took the airport limousine to the Robert Driscoll Hotel. That's item three, a dollar thirty-five. There, I got myself a room, not a suite, mind you, and unpacked my bags. Yeah, who is it? What do you mean, who is it? Come on, open up. Jackson, come in. All right, Johnny. Now, don't tell me you came around to make sure I didn't take too expensive a room. Sit down. Thanks. It's getting close to dinner time, Jack. Why don't I order up a couple of drinks? No, uh, listen, Johnny. Mm hmm? You'd uh, better not. <laughs> oh, come on. Don't tell me you were that serious about holding down on the expenses. Well, I was and I wasn't, but something's happened since I talked to you on the phone. Oh? Like what? Well, what I mean is it's. That's too late now. Too late for what? For you to do what I wanted you to do down here to see if you could do... What are you talking about? That is to say, look into this thing and see if I wasn't right about thinking maybe the best thing to do would be just to cancel the policy. What policy? I mean because of what happened just a few hours ago after I called you. Look, Jackson, this bush you're beating around is getting pretty big. What policy to whom and for how much and what's the matter with it? Okay. Straight life, Johnny. 25,000 bucks, and with the standard double indemnity clause. Yes, I know, for accidental death. Yes, darn it. Well, who's the insured? Well, Johnny, do you, uh, do you remember a character by the name of Lou Livercombe? No, I can't say that. Wait a minute. Little Louie Livercombe, that mm -hmm. slippery old stock promoter I chased all over the country a couple of years ago? Yes. And finally caught up with only to have a fast-talking mouthpiece get him off scot-free? The same. Oh, Jackson, don't tell me you issued a policy to a crook like little Louie. No, I didn't. At least uh, give me credit for some sense. But one of the boys in the office, a new kid, sold this policy to no. a Mr. Isaac Prellinger. Better known around the local pool halls as Smarty Ike. Mm -hmm. And that nickname is a pretty good description of him. No visible means of support, just a smart, fast-talking bum recently in from San Antonio. $25,000 policy, hmm? Yeah. When I found out about it, I, I didn't like it, but, well, I let it go through. Then, this morning, in a routine checkup, I found out who he named as beneficiary. Livercombe? Livercombe. No kidding. No kidding. 
And when the wheels began to turn in this uh, so-called brain of mine, I mean, the fact that I bought a policy that big, uh, though we apparently didn't have much dough. So maybe Livercombe put up the money for it on condition that he be named beneficiary with the idea of having him knocked off. Yes. And it wouldn't be the first time a crook like Louie tried a caper like that. But until I could be sure it's the same Livercombe, and the address we have for him is out in Eugene, Oregon. Oregon? Yeah. Or then he did clear out of where he'd been working when I caught up with him. Well, anyhow, that's why I called you. I figured if it is the same Livercombe, if you could find some evidence that he was paying for Ike's policy and planning to pull a fast one on us... And on Ike Prellinger. Right. Then I'd have sufficient reason to cancel out the policy. Okay, Jackson. Let me get some dinner and a good night's sleep. No, Johnny. And I'll run out there to Oregon. Did you say no? It's too late. Hmm? The dumpy little shack over on West Maple Street, where he lived alone. Yeah, what about it? Just a few hours ago. Burned to the ground. Oh? And Ike Prellinger was in it. Oh. Yeah. They're sure? Firemen, authorities, they're sure it was Prellinger's body they found there in the remains of the fire? No question of it, Johnny. Who identified it, Jack? I did. Mm. And I checked against the description on his policy. Oh, well, that's a pretty complete description. Oh, Tri-Western really goes overboard on that, Johnny. Not only a complete physical and medical history, but pictures, x-rays, the works. I know. And then just to make doubly sure, I had the lad who sold him the policy go over and take a look. Mm -hmm. So there's no question of it. The man who died in that fire was Ike Prellinger. So now we'll have to pay off to this Louis Livercombe. Like I said, Johnny, you got here too late. Maybe. Well, what can you do about it now? What started the fire? You remember uh, Pete Frawley. The arson squad? Yeah, one of the best. Yeah, I know. Pete says it was accidental and typical. Ike got himself drunk, fell on the bed with a lighted cigarette. First went the mattress, then everything else, including him. And Pete is sure of that? He's already made out and signed his report. Mm, he should know. He does. Well, I think I'll talk to him anyhow. Well, by all means. And I know what you're thinking. If this beneficiary is the same Louis Livercombe, there almost has to be something fishy. Uh, Jack, how about if I run a car and then meet you over at your office? You uh, want me to have Pete Frawley over there? No, I'll dig him up at headquarters. But first, I'd like a look at the policy involved on this one. Okay? Okay, Johnny. Anything you say. <laughs> Item four, dollar eighty-five for a quick bite in the Robert Bristol coffee shop. Item five, 50 bucks deposit on a rental car. Then over at Jack's office, despite the late hour, I took a long, careful look at the policy on Ike Prellinger, especially at the description of him. Jack was right. Try Weston does do a thorough job. Pete Frawley, the arson squad, had gone home for the night, but didn't hesitate a minute to get out of his robe and slippers, put on his shoes, and meet me at headquarters. We paid a visit to the morgue. Well, there you are, Dollar. Pretty badly burned, no features left, but there's no doubt it's Ike Prellinger. Same height, weight, teeth, build, general characteristics, everything. Mm-hmm. Including fingerprints? From this? Oh, no, impossible. Oh. But, Dollar, I checked him out against the description on the insurance policy, and so did Doc Wyman, the coroner. It's about as positive an ID as we could want. And that young fellow who sold him the policy was sure of it, too. Even he identified the finger ring and the watch. Mm -hmm. Even old Jerry Deeks was certain. Who's Jerry Deeks? He runs a pool parlor where Ike used to hang around. Well, you want me to fold down this sheet for a better look at him? No, no, don't bother. Um, what about an autopsy, Pete? <laughs> now, you don't think I'd have made out my report before Doc Wyman did his autopsy. No, Dollar, this is Ike, all right, and there is no doubt about it. Mm. Jack Price tells me uh, he said the fire was accidental. If you mean any signs of arson, the answer is no. There were none whatsoever. Only all the usual, typical signs of what actually happened. What do you mean, Pete? Well, a flock of empty whiskey bottles around... One of them that dropped out of his hand when he lay down on his bed, same as I've seen it a hundred times. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I was even able to isolate the ashes from the cigarette he'd had in his hand that set off the mattress at the point the fire actually originated. Now, wait a minute, Pete. Yeah, what? I have reason to suspect that somebody might have wanted to kill him. 
to collect his insurance and tried to use the fire as a cover-up. Yeah, yeah, I thought of that, too. But Doc Wyman found absolutely no sign of injury nor any poison in his system. What's more, Dollar, he wasn't killed before the fire because there were signs of smoke in the lungs. And I mean plenty. Mm. Of course, Pete, uh... Yeah? What is it, Dollar? Well, I mean, if somebody smothered him, you know, with a pillow or something, that would leave no marks. Before the fire? Yeah. Well, did you miss my point? Then there wouldn't have been smoke in the lungs. Now, wait a minute. He would have passed out before he stopped breathing entirely, wouldn't he? Yeah, possibly. In other words, a killer could have smothered him just enough to make him unconscious, then started the fire, let him get his lungs full, and... Well, then the fire would have finished the job. <laughs> Aren't you reaching a little bit, Dollar? Mm, maybe so, maybe no. Well, I mean, unless you can somehow turn up some evidence that he was murdered. No, it's just a hunch. But a potent one. Well, I know that neither Doc Wyman nor I could find anything to indicate it. And believe me, Dollar, I tried. I mean, I have just as suspicious a mind as you have. Okay, Pete. So, you want to look at the autopsy report? I'm sure Doc wouldn't mind. You want me to ask him? No, no, don't bother. But Why? Hmm? Well, I mean, why this powerful hunch? Oh, because of a man I chased halfway across the country a couple of years ago, who now lives in Oregon. I don't get it. He is the beneficiary of Ike's policy. I still don't get it. I think maybe I'd better fly on out there and pay him a visit. First, though, I drove around to Jerry Deke's pool room. Just why, I'm not sure now that I stopped to think about it. But you know something? It was Jerry Deeks who convinced me beyond the shadow of a doubt that my hunch was right. One hundred percent. What he... What he done for a living, Mr. Dollar? Yes, Mr. Deeks. Uh, anything I... Ike Perlinger made, he made right here, sir. Yes, sir. You mean with a pool cue? Well, uh, one of the steadiest shots I, I ever see. Mm -hmm. Most consistent, too. Yes, sir. In spite of the way he liked his liquor? Ike, liquor never would touch him. You sure of that? No, sir. Never, never touch him, sir, and I know. Well, how do you know? Well, uh, Tried to give him some once, like a, like a sort of present, for well, the way that he's brought a lot of customers in here. Said no, he did. Said such stuff was nothing but poison. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. For what? You may not know it, but you've said one word to me, loud and clear. Oh, what's that, sir? Murder. It's a welcome change sometimes to have neighbors drop in unexpectedly for a visit. Weekdays here on the CBS Radio Network, we have a group of friendly folks who like to drop in on you, cheer your day along, and never once get in the way. They're Arthur Godfrey, Art Linkletter, Gary Moore, Bing Crosby, and Rosemary Clooney. CBS Radio's daytime stars. Every weekday, they furnish fun and frolic mixed with music at this lilting location on your radio dial. Tune in the daytime stars. They're good company. Although it was now quite late, item six is ten cents for a phone call to Jack Price at his home. What? You still out and circulating around? I sure am, Jackson. Why don't you get some sleep? Hey, what's up? As soon as I can, I'm heading out to Eugene, Oregon. To check up on that beneficiary? Yep, among other things. What do you mean, other things? In the first place, I'm sure now that we have a murder case on our hands. Ike was murdered then? Oh, I didn't say that. What, well, what do you mean? Just got me a wild idea, Jackson. You remember that old saying, Ike and Mike, they look alike? Well, sure, but... Well, just what? give that a thought while you're driving over to your office to meet me. Twenty minutes. 
minutes later, in Jack's office, I took another look at Ike Fellinger's policy. I also went over the original application for it, and particularly the medical report and the x-rays. Well? Okay, Jackson. Now, if you don't mind, I'll use this phone. Well, sure, go ahead, Johnny. Help yourself. But you still haven't told me what you meant by the Ike and Mike bit. Just a hunch. But if it's the right one, there's a lot more to this case than meets the eye. So like what, for instance? Like the possibility, for instance. Hello? Hello? Johnny Dollar, Pete. Oh, why? Don't tell me you got on out there to Oregon already. No, but listen, I'll call you from there sometime in the morning. In the meantime... And you still think it was murder, huh? Now I'm sure of it. You found some bottles in the remains of that fire, and that made you think Ike had got drunk and made that typical mistake of setting off his mattress with a lighted cigarette. Well, I still think that's what happened. In spite of the fact he never touched the stuff? Yes, sir, in spite of the... What did you say? You heard me. Listen, I've just looked over the x-rays on Ike Prollinger. First thing in the morning, at the crack of dawn, get your Doc Wyman to do a further autopsy on that stiff. A further? Yes. Have him look for marks from an old fracture of the first metatarsal on the right foot. Oh, why? If he doesn't find any, then you get busy and phone a complete description of Ike to the Missing Persons Bureau up in San Antonio. That's where Ike lived one time before he came here. You think they might be looking for him? For him? No. Then I don't get it. But if that description ties in with somebody who is missing from up there... Uh, listen, Pete. Yeah? If it doesn't, then you'll have to try every other town in Texas if necessary until somebody does recognize that description. And if the name turns out to be Mike somebody or other... I still don't get it. Just do it, Pete. Call Missing Persons Bureau until you get a positive reaction to that description. I'll phone you tomorrow from Eugene, Oregon. All right, now, Jack, i got to get me on out to the airport and see what kind of connections I can make. The connections I could make were anything but good. Item 7 is $199.75, and my routing took me to Houston, to Los Angeles, to Portland, and then finally Eugene. Because of a stopover at every point, it was well into the next morning by the time I got there. Item 8... Twelve fifty for a cab to Lou Livercombe's place off Deming Road, out beyond the Fern Ridge Reservoir. It was the kind of modest, well-kept sort of home you'd expect a retired country gentleman to live in, rather than a crook. The reason for that high taxi charge is because I asked the cabbie to wait for me. Remember that. As for Livercombe, he was the same suave, slippery old character I'd known two years before. Yes, I heard from uh, from an old contact of mine that Ike Fellinger died down there in Corpus Christi. Too bad, darling. He was an old friend of mine. Yes, so I understand. As a matter of fact, he made me the beneficiary of his insurance. I've already mailed in a claim. Why did he name you, Livercombe? Why not? We used to work together, Ike and I. You still working together? Don't be ridiculous, Dollar. How could we be if he's dead? Tell me, where have you been the past couple of days? Right here. I haven't gone out beyond the mailbox for nearly a week. Mm -hmm. Can you prove that? Yes, I can prove it. Ask my next-door neighbor, old Morgan. I've seen and talked with him two or three times every day. And Mrs. Teller on the other side. I helped to gather in some wood yesterday morning. Yesterday morning, hmm? Yes. Yesterday afternoon, she brought me over an apple pie she'd made. All of which makes a, a nicely set-up alibi for you, doesn't it? Now, look here, Dollar. I don't know what you're getting at, but if you think you can tie me in with Frelinger's getting knocked off... Did you... I say that? Didn't you learn a couple of years ago that when you try to pin something on me, all you're going to do is fall flat on your face? Suppose we see. Mind if I use your phone? Well? Go ahead. Thanks. The call was to Pete Frawley at police headquarters back in Corpus Christi. And the result of Dr. Weinman's further autopsy and Pete's call to San Antonio? Dollar, I don't know how you do it. Yeah, Pete. No broken bone in the foot of that stiff, so your hunch was right. It wasn't Ike Prellinger at all. It was somebody who was a dead ringer for him. Taken there, planted there by Ike? Well, that we can't be sure of. Anyway, not yet. I'm sure of it. But now listen. Like you suggested, I called the MPB in San Antonio. Now, the missing man on their list fitted Ike's description perfectly. His name was Mike Ringler. So how you figure that one, I'll never know. All right. Now, do you see what it means, Pete? No, you tell me. 
When Ike found that he had a double there in San Antonio, it gave him an idea. So we moved down to Corpus to carry it out. What was it? He got in touch with and made a deal with his old colleague in crime, Lou Livercombe, out here in Eugene. If Lou would pay the premium on a nice hunk of insurance, then when he supposedly died, they could split it. In this case, with double indemnity, a total of 50000 bucks. Well, I'm a son of a gun. Yeah, uh, it's an old one, but it's worked more than once. Now, wait. We still have to round up Ike Prellinger. Don't give that a second thought, Pete. I'll simply make the most of Lou's hospitality here in his home for a while. You'll what? For just as long as necessary. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see. Then when Ike arrives to pick up his cut of the insurance money, he thinks... Well, Pete, I'll be right here and ready and waiting. Okay, buddy. Hang it up. Hang it up, I said. Johnny? You hear me? You see this? I'll, uh, talk to you later, Pete. Well, Ike Prellinger, hmm? That's right. Who are you? Who is he, Lou? Don't you know him? That's Johnny Dollar, the insurance detective. Oh, it is, huh? Well, Donna, you won't be talking to anybody. Not later, not any time. You see this? Haven't you made enough mistakes already, Ike? Plug him, Ike. Let him have it. All right, all right, Lou. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Right. Now, listen, mister. Cabby. Hey, out of my way. Hey, what's going on? Look out, Cabby. Watch him. Oh, no, you do. Oh, yes, I do. Oh, Ike. And now you, Lou. No. Holy mother of... Wow. Thanks, Cabby, for barging in the door that way and throwing him off balance. Wow-wee. What you done to him? Say, what goes, anyhow? Plenty. I'll tell you all about it while we drive these babies into police headquarters. Yep. It was good hunting. Not only because Ike will have to pay for the murder of Mike Ringler, but... More important to me, because Lou Livercombe is finally ending up where he belongs, behind bars. Expense account total? Oh, why don't you figure it up, Jackson? And uh, don't forget my commission on the insurance that won't have to be paid out. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, only the shadow of a doubt locks up the case for me. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone. Produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were William Redfield as Pete Frawley, Maurice Tarplin as Jack Price, Reynold Osborne as Louis Livercombe, Lawson Zerby as Deeks, Ralph Bell as Ike Pullinger, and Bill Lipton as the cab driver. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Bill Gillian speaking. If someone you know has had an accident or an operation, the chances are he was given blood or blood plasma to prevent shock or to replace lost blood. Or perhaps one of your children came down with the measles and was given a shot of gamma globulin. That required blood for its manufacture. Whenever emergency arises in accidents, operations, or disasters, blood is urgently needed. And there's no time to get it after the emergency arises. It must be there always ready for immediate use. The agency that collects the blood for our military and civilian hospitals and keeps blood banks all over the country well stocked is the Red Cross. This is only one of the countless invaluable services performed by this wonderful organization. One of the ways in which you can help the Red Cross is by giving blood regularly. There are many other ways you can help, too, doing various kinds of other useful volunteer jobs. Right now, during Red Cross Month, join and serve and help the Red Cross stay on the job for you.